Yesterday we heard from David, from Margaret, from Douglas about how they teach CS50, and today we'll dive into how you can teach CS50, either as a new teacher or a beginning, or a new teacher or an experienced teacher as well. So just to highlight, from last uh, yesterday's workshop, we had the souvenir photo. This is now available on csu.ly slash workshop. Go ahead and go to that URL here, and you can find that photo to begin. Um, so chances are, whether you're a new teacher or an uh, experienced teacher, you felt something like this. There are so many resources available to you, so many pathways you could go down. And I hope today we find a way to kind of string out some of that anxiety and hopefully make you feel a little less nervous, a little more, uh, feeling a little more confident how to teach CS50 here and take advantage of all the resources that we have. So the best way to begin teaching CS50 is actually to take the course. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to go to take our course on edX, via open courseware, et cetera, to really understand how the course's tools work, how the problem sets work, and be able to dive into the content. You can then teach that to your students. But once you begin, or once you've like finished taking CS50, how do you then start teaching it? So I'm really pleased to say that we have a brand new handbook at this URL right here, csu.tf. And I hope you won't mind if we do a bit of a whirlwind tour of this handbook. And afterwards, we'll do some informal Q&A and then formal Q&A later in the day. So once you go to this URL here, you will see a few courses on the left-hand side. And one of those courses might appeal to you, maybe CS50 AP or CS50 X. And when you click on that URL, you will then see all of the resources available to teach that course. And this is designed to be an accompaniment to the actual CS50 curriculum you can find on these pages here. So maybe let's dive into one of your first questions, which is how do you start building your curriculum for CS50? Well, let's take CS50 AP as an example. So maybe I go to the AP page of the CS50 handbook, and I see that this uh, dropdown here for curriculum has two links to it. That first link is the home page of CS50 AP. And if you go there, you'll see a few deadlines that are important to you if you're uh, kind of beholden to the college board, you're trying to hit their deadlines for your students as well. So we give you a broad overview of the curriculum here, including its syllabus, its deadlines, and so on. And maybe you want to dive deeper into the content for this curriculum. So you can go to that curriculum uh, next link down there, that 2022-2023 uh, curriculum page, and you can then see all the courses, lectures, problem sets, and units, so to speak, as we go through CS50. Now, in CS50, we tend to break these units into individual weeks. We spend one week on each unit, but that is certainly not the case for you. Maybe you want to spend more time on certain pieces. Maybe you want to spend less time. That is totally OK. And what I encourage you to do is think about your curriculum as a series of days you could fill in with CS50 material. So let's say I have this number of days. Maybe each one is a week here. Every row is a week. And I want to figure out how I can slot in some of CSU's curriculum. Well, what you can do is you can take a look at all of our units here and figure out which one you might want to spend more time on. Maybe I want to kick off things off with Scratch. So I'll spend maybe the first four days on Scratch. And maybe with C, I want to spend more time there. So I'll spend maybe even five or six days on C. And maybe arrays, we get through those a little faster than expected. So we might be spending fewer time on that. And then we go to algorithms, spend a lot of time on algorithms. And finally, we close things out with memory. So this is all to highlight how flexible the curriculum is and how it's really your job as a teacher to figure out what do you want to take and adapt from CS50. As we've heard Margaret and Douglas say, they most frequently adapt CS50 rather than just adopt the entire thing outright. Now, even the lectures themselves can be adapted. It's quite a long, uh, you have to have quite a long attention span, I think, particularly for working with younger students, to sit down and watch a three-hour lecture. And so it's really important to maybe pick pieces from lecture that you really want to show and highlight. And you can do that maybe by sharing URLs and so on. But we've also created a tool for you called video.csu.io that you can actually paste the URL of a lecture video into and then set the time code you want that lecture to start and the time code you want the lecture to end, and it'll give you a new URL that has that lecture shortened to that particular time code. So you can share that URL with your students and make sure your students are getting bite-sized pieces of lecture. Now, even from there, you can focus on short videos. We also have uh, videos made by my colleague Doug here, who has made lots of sort of bite-sized pieces that dive into the course's content. You're certainly welcome to use these and disperse them throughout your cur curriculum as well. And if you focus on the problem sets, having taken the course yourself, you'll know that we have a variety of problem sets to differentiate for your students. We have those people who are more comfortable, those people who are less comfortable. And even more recently, um, we've been figuring out how ways to adapt the course for those who are maybe least comfortable or somewhere in between as well. So this is an overview of how we can use the curriculum, how you can start to plan out your semester. But you might still have questions about how you actually show up and you teach the material. It's one thing to have that plan, but how do you show up day to day and actually have materials to teach to your students? So I'm glad to say that if you go to this um, next page here, this little next drop down, these teaching resources, you'll find many resources to begin your work. Some of them made by our own teachers, Douglas and Margaret here. 
Um, we've already seen Douglas's daily checks from yesterday, and we've seen Margaret's practice problem. So today I want to focus on the lesson materials here, as well as our grading and feedback guides. Now, our lesson materials are designed to be um, useful to you and most frequently probably adapted. These are based on what we call sections here at Harvard, where sections are kind of long classes from 90 minutes to two hours, in which we dive into lectures content and focus on hands-on exercises to help uh, make those concepts come to life. So these weeks down below, you can see down right, right here, are all based on those same section materials that we use day to day here at Harvard. And if you go and click on one of those weeks, let's say we focus on week one for C, you'll be able to find a few uh, sample materials here to use in your own classrooms. Um, one of my favorites here are these programming exercises. So let's say I really like to lead my class in such a way that I have students work on a problem. And after they work on that problem, I come back and we do live coding to build a solution together. So these problems are perfect for that. This is actually the problems that I use in my own classes here at Harvard to have students do that. I'll usually share some content, we'll do an exercise, come back and live code these things together. So all of the exercises are available right here on these last materials pages. You might also find it helpful to use our discussion questions. Let's say your students want to discuss or break into groups and talk about these materials. We have a few proposed discussion questions you can use for students to talk to amongst each other or even as a whole class as a whole. And even one of the more robust materials here, I would say, are our annotated sample slides, so down below right here. If you click on these, you'll find slides that we use here at Harvard. And they're not just slides that you can go ahead and just adopt as is. They're actually annotated. They have some notes about why we've done things in a certain way. We take a look at the example slides for C. So here we have a bit of a welcome page for how to use these slides. And as you go through, you'll actually see in the speaker notes some notes on why we've chosen to do something a certain way, why we chose to talk about a contact application in this, in this slide, for example, and how you too could adapt the slides to your own students there. So our goal is to make these as friendly as possible so you can figure out how you can, how, what you might want to keep and what you might want to change as you go through. Um, and so now that we've seen our teaching materials here, you maybe have your plan for your curriculum, you have some materials you can use in your classroom. Um, we want to figure out how you actually receive student work, how can students submit work to you. And we heard a bit about this from Douglas yesterday about how he uses submit.safety.io. And I encourage you to go ahead and actually take, out, uh, take a look at some of our tools here, among them Check50, Submit50, and Submit.cf2.io. All of these, again, are linked on that page, cf2.tf, and we provide documentation for how to use each of these tools. If it's helpful, we even have a video from CF2's own Brian Yu from uh, maybe two years ago now for how he uses CF2's tools for submitting a reading, how you too can use them as an educator. So we won't focus as much on these in this presentation, but certainly have many resources including documentation and these videos for you to dive into these as well. And now, once you receive your student work, maybe you have your curriculum, you have your teaching materials, you have a way to receive student work, you might still need a way to give feedback on that work. And so we've been working hard to make sure you have those materials to give good feedback for your students. That's quick and responsive, what Douglas highlighted yesterday for us. So in terms of feedback, we have these new feedback guides. And here we talk about how we give feedback in CSFD here on campus. On campus, we talk about correctness, design, and style, where correctness is, does your code work? Design is how well does it work, and style is how pretty is it, is it readable, and so on. So design is where we as teachers tend to give qualitative feedback. We maybe make a note on a student's code, we say, have you thought about doing it this way or that way, and so on. And when we think about design, we think about it in terms of a kind of five point axis here, where five points indicates exceptional proficiency. We can't find any improvements to a student's code. A one might be something where you know, a student is probably below proficiency and there are several misconceptions and so on. Um, most often, students tend to score here at Harvard on the good, on a three or the four, but you're welcome to sort of adjust this to your own needs as well. All this is adaptable to your own students. Um, what we've done as a guide for how to grade design, whether you're using this five point scale or not, is we've taken um, some samples of student submissions and gone ahead to see what indicates good design and what indicates worse design for each of the course's problems. And you can find those guidelines here linked on that page for each of the problem sets in the course. And again, what we did is this past fall, we looked at student submissions in CS50. And we took a random sample of maybe 15 to 20 submissions for every problem. And we looked at those submissions. We said, what is the evidence of good design here? And what is evidence of worse design? And using that data, we created each of these individual problem grading guidelines. So let's take a look at the ones for Speller, for example, in problem set five. Here we have evidence of a five-point submission 
evidence of a four-point submission, three-point, two-point, and so on. So we've tried to give you, for every function in Speller, what you might see if a student has demonstrated exceptional mastery, and what you might see if a student still has some ways to go to develop their mastery in the subject as well. And we've also provided you some examples from those submissions, anonymized here, of what a worse implementation might look like and what a better implementation might look like. And so once you see these guidelines, you're able to go ahead and see examples of student code that people have actually written and see which one we consider maybe worse or better design as students go through those problem sets. So again, these are going to be helpful for you as you go ahead and give student feedback to sort of calibrate what might be good design, what might be worse design. And as you go ahead and give feedback, it's also really important to have a way to keep that feedback organized. And so as we talk about managing your classroom, we saw Douglas talk about this a little bit yesterday, but today we'll dive even deeper in a session later today on GitHub Classroom, how we can use that to manage your own classroom here. We won't dive in today, but we'll certainly, well, we won't dive in right now, but we'll dive in later today on how to manage your classroom with GitHub Classroom in this case. So with all of these tools, and to give a whirlwind tour here, um, I do want to highlight one particular um, unique aspect of our community, which is that once you've gotten the hang of all these materials, I really encourage you to figure out how you can contribute to CFTT itself. Um, we're made better by all of our educators who contribute practice problems, who write daily checks, who make materials and share them back to our community. And so I want to highlight a few ways for you yourself to do some of that work. Um, one thing you can do is you can actually go ahead and write your own problem sets. You can write your own problem set checks and so on. So we provide you documentation on how to write your own problem checks when you make your own problems for your students. You're also welcome to critique our own checks, our own problems. We have many open source repositories on GitHub that you can make a pull request into to share how you think this check should be written. And we'll take a look at that and see if we can implement it in the actual core CS50 uh, software, et cetera. And then um, we're also inviting you to go ahead and contribute your practice problems, as Margaret has done, or your daily checks, as Douglas has done. Again, we're made better by all of these materials that you share back to us in the end. Um, so it's just about five minutes left to go in this session. I want to kind of wrap us up here and just say that we'll do an informal Q&A in just a bit. Um, but this was a brief tour of the CFTT Handbook, and I'm excited to see what you all will do with it.